Welcome back, everyone. We appreciate that you're coming in and getting your seat for our 1.30 session. We had a great noon session, a great roundtable discussion, lots of participation. We appreciate everyone that sat in on that. and We're very busy here getting those items on the wish list that were requested to share those with Matthew. Um, for this session, today's been our team giveaways, and we gave away a welcome back pizza party this morning to a lucky winner whenever they can come get back together at their office. We will fund that uh, luncheon. And this session, we're going to do the coffee break. So we have a coffee sampler packet that will come to you from Savannah to kind of stock your break room when you can get back in there. But for this session, we are here to talk with Maxie. I'm going to bring Maxie, if you can bring your webcam up so everybody can meet you. There she is. Maxie's welcoming us into her home office. And she is a 2017 ACE, which with you were with us yesterday, that stands for an ACEWARE Champion Educator. And this award is given to an individual who uses ACEWARE in innovative ways and serves as a very positive ACEWARE leader for their unit. And you won't find many more positive, encouraging folks than Maxie, for sure. UTEP is very lucky to have her as a representative for their university. Their professional and public programs, Maxie, you go by P3, correct? Okay. They average right. around 1,200 courses annually with over 9,000 enrollments. When Maxie and I chatted last week, she told me their June summer youth programs were set to go. And they're very busy. They have 78 online classes moving forward with five different um, age-based sessions running each day. And so I was thinking we may need to get with you, Maxie, and just let you have some time to tell your story to everyone here. I think they would appreciate hearing that. But we appreciate that her team, that while they're running these programs, as we have our meeting, they're sharing her And she's going to share with us about how they use coding at UTEP. And Matthew, uh, Matthew, Maxie, I am going to turn things over to you. I'm going to turn over the controls to you. And I'm going to go off camera so that the full attention can be to your presentation. And I will see your screen here shortly, I'm sure. And we'll let you share all about coding. Great. Thank I'm you, not, Shane. Not seeing, not seeing your, there you are. See you now. Here I am. You okay. are. Presentation and Maxi. All yours. Okay. Awesome. Um, I'm so excited to share all of uh, the information about Coding for Success. That was such a wonderful introduction of not only myself, but our, uh, our team. We're working so hard from home and just like everybody else, um, just running with what we find that will work for our department. So hopefully something I share with you guys today will will work for you, or maybe you get um, something, a light turns on because something uh, rings a bell that works for you. So I'm going to start uh, my presentation on Coding for Success. I think I'm starting it. On this first slide, that's actually a picture of you, Tess. Where I, where I work and what, what it looks like from an aerial point. Um, but um, for our agenda, I'm hopefully keeping it short and simple. We're going to go over course codes, subject codes, grouping codes, and reports. And uh, hopefully all of this ties in together because um, it makes sense to me. But maybe that's because I've been using ACEWAR for 18 years now. So to start, we have a very uh, systematic approach to our course code, and ho I'm hoping that a lot of you do as well. Um, so I broke it down so you can see um, how we do it. So we start off with the year 20, indicates uh, our calendar year. So whatever the first two digits are, 18, 19, 20, 21, we'll know what year we're talking about. The next uh, digit would be 
a letter, we use S for summer, T for spring, and F, F for fall. And then we go into the fourth digit, which runs a lot of our uh, reports is the fourth digit because we have uh, we break down our entire department into programs and so we have 16 different programs that we uh, use our course codes uh, with and so we you'll see a list of all of our 16 areas that we work in and then the next two digits we use are our subject codes and it's so that we know um, you know, what are we offering? Are we offering science or hobbies or art, music, math? Uh, we have countless lists and we're constantly updating our, uh, our course offerings, so we're constantly updating our subject code. And then our last four digits, we consider that like what it indicates the course code, but it could be broken down into levels or uh, age groups if it's in the morning, in the afternoon, and I'm gonna share a couple of our course codes so that you can better understand what, hopefully, what I'm, what I'm talking about. Here we go. So for our first course code I'm showing you here, it's 20 S A P I 1001. So that would indicate that it's the year 2020 summer, and AP is our Advanced Placement Summer Institute, and then we have 1001. For our AP courses, we have two weeks of AP, one week in June and one week in July, and we offer 12 different subject areas uh, for each month. So in this case, we have the 1001, which would mean it is the June AP week. And then it's so simple, we have any classes in July would be 20 SAPI2. And we kind of keep it um, with 1001, 1002, 1003. And the same for July is 2001, 2002, 2003. So we know how many courses we have for each week. And then the bottom one, is a little bit more complicated. Um, so it's 20 S K I T O 1 P 6. It almost sounds like it's a Star Wars um, character, but so it's 2020 for the year, S for summer, K for kids on campus, I T for, in this case, I T technology. O is for online because we actually, um, transitioned in a matter of a month, 300 online courses for our kids, which actually 300 in-person courses for our kids to online live courses for our kids. We actually are offering 78, like Sharon mentioned earlier. And then the number one stands for week one. We're actually having 10 weeks of summer camps online. The letter P is for PM because we're offering an option in the morning and an option in the afternoon. And then the number six is our grade level. So we offer kindergarten as one group, first through second as another, third through fifth as another age group, six to eight and nine to 12. So in this case, it would be an IT course in the afternoon for grade six through eight. And we get all of that from our course code. Um, so we're going to go to our next slide, which is our first poll. How many of you have a you system, have system for your course code? Raise your hands, folks, if you have a very specific system for coding. Oh, looks like quite a few do. Um, I would say about 50% of those that you're speaking with today have a very unique system of coding. Awesome. Well, hopefully the other 50% are not asleep with this, with this presentation, and they're just trying to figure it out. Um, as we continue through the presentation, you'll see how important codes are. Ours always start off with 
the course code um, because that's, that's going to help us across the board with everything else. So the reason why we have a system in place is one is it keeps our data organized. Um, as Sharon mentioned, we have 9,000 enrollments a year. We've been using ASOR, I think, since like 1997. So we have a lot of data in our system. And so this helps us stay organized, especially when it comes to course codes, because that's what drives our our day to day. And it will also help with program information. When you look at the code, you're able to know what program area it lands in, and you're able to know where to find information to share with your customers, or if you need to reach out to a coordinator or manager, you know exactly who to, who to reach out to. This also helps our registration team to upsell. When they're on the phone uh, taking registrations and they know that they're registering someone in yoga, which for us would be a health and wellness class, they could also look at other health and wellness classes to offer the participant to register for. So course codes help us not only stay organized, but we can also upsell which is kind of what we want to do. We want to upsell as much as we can, and it's as simple as our course code. So then subject codes were within um, our course codes, which you can see here it's indicated with the red box. And so subject codes are, can be found uh, in ACEWARE. We call it ACEWARE. I know it's student manager. Slap me on the on the wrist. Um, but subject codes, we have a slew of them, and you simply not only have it in the course code, but then you have your drop down arrow and you can choose um, what your subject code is. Now, this is important because it brings us to our next poll. And our next poll is do you know that your subject codes show in your participant account information? Okay, folks, raise your hand. And yeah, I keep seeing hands come up, come up. You probably heard Chuck people, over my shoulder people, saying. A lot of people. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> oh, I'm pushing it. They still come up. Okay. I say a little over 50%. What do you say, Chuck? Do you agree? Uh, close to 50, but mm -hmm. that's disappointing. <laughs> Carry on. That, that, Chuck, you know what? It is disappointing, but if I were to ask my staff this, they might not know the answer either. So we're going to let them slide on it for a little bit. By the end of this presentation, though, they should re be considering how subject codes are important for their program. So I feel like there's a lag here. So this is what our registration looks like, and the subject codes are show up as interest areas in a participant's online account. So they can choose what, um, what they're interested in, because then we can run reports and, and see uh, what's popular, what's not popular, what people are saying, is that something we want to dive into, look for instructors, find a, a place to hold it. And so our list is quite extensive because we offer quite a bit of courses. So this is what it looks like on our online registration um, account. And then it's also added in our name record. So my, I use my record because I use mine as a test for everything as well as all the courses that I do take. So you can see the list is quite long on the subject area. So whenever somebody is online and they add these to uh, their account, or even when they register for a class, it'll stamp this area in the name record uh, so that it shows that the, those are the interests that they have. And then it also puts the date um, so that you know when they were interested in, because our climate is always changing. As you can see for CT right in the middle, it says, um, I was interested in it October 19, 2012. And so uh, is that still relevant for me today? Probably probably not, because you could see that I've updated a lot of my interests. 
So why use subject codes? What? We want to stay organized. That's going to be my answer for everything today. We want to stay organized with all the data that we collect. This will help with all our reports that we run. And then um, we want to know because then we know what the participant interests are in. We're constantly changing. If 2020 hasn't taught us anything about change, I don't know what possibly can. Um, but everything's changing. We we went from Zumba to Aqua Zumba, and we've gone from Pilates and yoga to Pai Yoga. And so um, everything is changing, and we want to keep up with that. And we want to stay organized. So we're moving into grouping codes. Grouping codes are used to, or to categorize your courses in, in groups for ACEWEB purposes. Uh, you can use multiple groups for one course. So for example, if you want uh, an English conversation for beginners course to show up in your English language institute electives, now this is all relative to our department. You can also have it in the languages and cultural studies group. So you don't have to just assign one, one grouping code to one course. It can have several. Now, I have to remind our managers and coordinators that cross-marketing is great, but too much cross-marketing is not. So we don't want to find too many courses everywhere because then all it does is jumble the information and confuses our customers. So we really try to streamline our grouping codes to match our catalog and to match uh, the subject codes. So, that way, when somebody is looking for a language class, they know they can go to a certain area and find that. We don't want to have a language class in a, in a cooking class or in a HR class. We want to make sure that it, it makes sense where we're finding all the courses. So that brings us to poll number three. That means I'm talking way too fast because I'm so excited. So how many of you use two tiers for your grouping codes? All right, she's going to keep you busy. Two tier grouping uh, codes. Raise your hands. Give a couple more seconds. Okay, just only about ten are using the two tiers for grouping codes. Okay. Well, maybe right. some some others some don't of, know what the tiers are, so maybe after explaining how we use it, then maybe they'll be using it. So thank you for answering that poll. So tier one for us is our program area. Like I mentioned earlier, we have 16 programs within our one department. And from those 16 areas, we have five managers that handle these areas. We also are constantly adding and or subtracting depending on um, what's going on, what changes are coming, what's not. Right now, we don't have a lot of room reservations because we're not on campus. So our program area for that would, would be small. Um, but a lot of areas, we, we try to keep, we try to make sense of all of this. And so this is tier one. So when they're in, in ACELEB, they can see these areas and um, it's an awesome function because you can add pictures, you can add a description, um, even Aceware or Student Manager has it so that you can generate your HTML code so anyone can add, make those changes. And so this is a small snippet of ours, uh, what ours looks like. Um, my, my screen is small, so I couldn't show all the areas, but it's nice to see that if you want to look for adult leisure and learning classes, you see it there with the description of corporate and business training. And so it breaks it down. We try and stay consistent with everything that we do to make sure that um, it is what, what, what goes with our mission and vision. And so we're constantly updating this information as well. So then tier two goes into our subject area. Oh, and this is the same as tier one. So our subject areas, um, don't look at this slide. I'm gonna make you use your imagination. 
um, but it's the two letter code and so we have all sorts of things we even have some that are work for multiple programs so for instance we have a um, HR and IT and HR works for our corporate and business training program, as well as our adult leisure and learning. And then we have IT, which again works for our corporate and business training, but it also works for our uh, kids on campus. So we have um, a whole bunch of subject areas. This is not the list. I, cause if I needed to add it, we would probably have more slides on our subject areas than the rest of the slides that we're sharing now. So right now we're summertime. This is our second tier for P3 Kids on Campus. Um, we have a, everything going on in the rest of our departments, so I don't want to take away from them, even though I'm using Kids on Campus as the, the slide here. So we have the whole group, which is our summer program, of 10 weeks, and then we break it down by uh, grade. So we want to make sure that the kids that are participating are participating at the level that they are, even if it's not online. When we have our in-person um, classes for the kids, we make sure that they're in there. So when we register them in Student Manager or they register themselves on ACEWEB, we do ask for date of birth to make sure that they're in the right class. We want to set up the students for success in their learning environment. So we don't want a first grader in a sixth or eighth grade, even though the class sounds cool, which they do sound cool, because I want to join some of those classes, but I can. So moving on, we're going to talk real quick about reports, and hopefully I'll, I'll stretch it out a little bit longer. Um, but as you guys probably know, Student Manager has reports everywhere, which is phenomenal because we can find something for the information that we're putting into ACER. And so the next couple of reports I'm going to share with you where to find them. I was actually inspired by uh, Rasmus Ankerson. He wrote a book called Hunger in Paradise. And what he talked about was looking at your data and your numbers in a different way. We have the same numbers and we have the same data, but what are we looking at and how can we look at it different? Or what are we not looking at? It's there in front of us, but we're not looking at it. So uh, the statistics area is one of the areas uh, that we love to use in our department. The managers have uh, come around to using it more often for, for a lot of the reports that we give to our director. And so the first area is under reports, statistics, names, and demographics summary. And we have the option of choosing all sorts of codes, especially from the name records. So anything that you want to find out, you can about your participants. Uh, one of the areas that we focus on in this is actually a user-defined field, which is our register.rg creator. And the reason why we use this is for our registration team. Our registration team is set, uh, set up with eight student staff members. And they have different schedules according to their class. And so we, um, we see that they're a very close-knit group of students. And so we wanted to create a friendly competition. And we use one of the reporting in there, and we just modified it up slightly so that we could see how it works for us. So those are all of our students uh, that take registration. And what we do is we actually post it in our registration room so that they could see who had how many registrations and how much money. Um, we thought at first like it was going to be like, is this something we should encourage or is this something we should not encourage and we found out that they loved it the students were so competitive they were running to answer phones they were running to send confirmations online they were trying to get their numbers 
higher and more. They were upselling and and they did all the things that they were already trained to do, but in a, a much more enthusiastic, competitive way. So it was a great way to get our registry registration team uh, to to be excited about coming to work. It even made me, I'm an athlete, and it even made me more excited to watch them uh, do this. So here in this report, you can see how many names they they took, how many uh, registrations they took and how much money and what was their average. And then going to our next report is also in statistics and it's under the course and course data summary. And again, in this area, you can run a report on so many codes. In this case, uh, we're running a subject code um, report and that's because what have I been talking about? Subject codes, right? Course codes, subject codes, and grouping codes. So subject codes is what runs this next report. And we call it Manager's Cancellation Report. And Sharon was right. Earlier, she said that I was very positive. And I like to think that I am pretty positive. And we even spin the AW pending to all pending because, ah, oh, they didn't finish registering, so we want to take their money, ah. Oh. So we have a system where we, we call our all pending. So, but in this report, I called it the cancellation report because that's one of the areas we really needed to work on. We were offering a whole bunch of classes and we were getting registrations for a lot. But we were also canceling a lot of classes. And that's not what we wanted to do. So um, again, this is a report that's already there in Student Manager. And we just made a few uh, adjustments to what it was that our program needed. And so this is a report that we share on a monthly basis with all our managers. And I remember the first time we shared this report, our youth program, which is this is the report um, that he saw, our youth program court, uh, manager looked so sad. I thought he was going to cry. And what he said was like life altering for us in the office. He said, 65% of my classes canceled. That means 65% of my effort went down the drain. And we all just stayed silent. That's right, 65% of his efforts went down the drain. And after that, you could see all the managers try and figure out, like, how can we do this better? So they were able to look at their subject codes, see what they were offering, how many were canceled. We even looked at how many registrations were canceled. So even if a class was a go, but we had a few registrations that canceled, why were they canceling? Did they have a change in? Um, their calendar, did they not like the class, did they um, register for the wrong class. So we even looked into why those registrations were being canceled even though the class was a go. And then who doesn't like to see money? We all want to see how much money is coming in as well as how much money is going out because we are paying for instructors, supplies, rooms, and everything else that goes with running a course. So it was great to have all this information in one report. And that way, we meet together as managers and discuss this. And we try and figure out how we can better support each program as a whole. So lucky, uh, luckily, I get to report to you that even though our youth programs canceled 65% of their classes in fall of 2018, they actually only canceled 40% of their classes in fall of 2019. So that's a huge improvement, uh, which we have, we all took a vested interest in it and we all made it happen. But it was all because we actually looked at the numbers there in a different way. And so, Again, this report is there in Student Manager for you. You just need to tweak it to what works best for your team and what kind of outcome you're looking for. So 
I probably talked way too fast because we're almost done. Things to remember, be organized, keep your data organized. There's so much data in Student Manager that is going to make you successful. And if you're not organized, it's not going to be a good thing. Codes are connected. As you can see, our, our course codes are connected to our subject codes, which are connected to our grouping codes. It all uh, works together. Something I didn't mention earlier was that we also use our social media to, to advertise according to our grouping codes. Um, so we even take it as far as, as our social media to include in all of our coding. So all of those codes that I talk about, plus all the codes that are still in there that I didn't talk about, there's a report for any and all of it. All, all of the data, all of the fields, all of the codes, there's some report. So reach out to your technicians and find out. You can even reach out to me. Um, you'll see my email at the end here uh, so that we can, we can share what we have because we have a ton of, of reports that we've created or modified from what was already there in Student Manager. Whew. Questions? Actually, one quick question was um, on the book you mentioned, that was Hunger in Paradise, right? And the author's name Correct. again, and I'll send that note to folks. So, Yes, it was Rasmus Ankerson. R-A-S-M-U-S -S Ankerson, A-N-K-E-R-S-E-N. -E and I can send that to you as well. And Nickerson? Ankerson. Anchorson, like anchor on the boat. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. I Which sent that as a great. note to everybody. Um going to say, yeah, I think you've 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 encouraged a lot of people to revisit the coding on that. One of the things you might mention um is that in terms of updating codes and 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 I've you got your live system up, but if you are wanting to look at codes, um, what you've got, if you go into the update tool, there is a code editing option. Um, one of the big things about codes for you know coding uh, within names or courses is deactivating old codes uh, for like coordinator names or topics, uh, you know, subject codes that you no longer use, but you don't want to delete is the idea that you can deactivate a code and not uh, have it show when you're assigning it to new new records. So <clears throat> I don't know whether you yes. can jump. Um, I can check if I can log in, but um, we, oh, do, or, we, uh, well, do, we do use ahead. that. Sorry, we do use that function area because um, you know, with the changes, we want to stay as up to date as possible, and we even have kind of a, like a, a system in place. So we deactivate everything for six months, and then we review it. And if there's anything that we need to delete, then we do it after a year. And sometimes that year turns into 18 months. Um, but we try to we try to keep everything active or deactivated, uh, updated as much as possible. Um, as you said, like in the coordinator section, um, we sometimes people come and go, and then sometimes we're pretty solid with our staff members, and so we need to make sure that the information there is is correct, and um, because we want to know what our product is, and we need to make sure that those codes are up to date. Um, we do have a question here uh, from Nida. Is how do you have the interest code options show on online registration for students to check? And actually, Sharon, since uh, that Maxie doesn't have her live up, can you give me control and I can illustrate that for Nida here? So, all right. So, basically, if you are working with interest codes and through the Add edit codes area. So we're going to go to name interest codes. Uh, one of the things you can do with interest codes is this checkbox right here. Do not display interest codes on ACEWeb. 
typically the default setup for interest codes is that any interest code you create that is active that does not have the exclude box checked, those codes will appear on ACEWeb. And, and again, um, uh, Maxi, one of the things I recommend is that if you've got really fine grained interest codes, in other words, you've really got them split pretty fine, um, that we'd recommend not to have more than one screen full of interest codes for the student to check because that gets to be um, gets to be a challenge. So, I, I all right. Agree. Um, there's one more. Suzanne is asking, and this is a, the good one, we constantly struggle with using tracking codes to find out where our students are coming from. Any ideas on the best ways to capture this data, and especially for online enrollments where there are people are registering online? Do you have any uh, ways to encourage or browbeat or? Yeah, I think we all struggle with tracking codes. Maybe this is just our experience or maybe some of our experience. Um, but we also try to keep um, things general. We, we do a lot of social media. We do campus announcements. We do mass emails through our um, student manager system. And, and we do our, a printed catalog. So we try to keep um, a lot of what we're doing um, sort of group together, but anything that we print, we also put the tracking code on there so that we know we printed a thousand brochures or a thousand postcards and we put it into our system. And that, But on those, those pieces that we printed, we always put the tracking code on there to help because we do, when we do get calls, people will say, well, I read this and this about that class. Well, what was this class and what was that information? And if they have it printed in front of them, we can ask them for a tracking code. Um, so I wish I had something better. Our marketing team is constantly trying to figure out better ways to collect that information, but you just have to stay on top of it and, and, and find that thing that works for your marketing team. Yeah, and this is, I think, my screen up here with the AceWeb uh, sandbox, uh, Maxi. You know, the idea is that how do you get people to to fill that in? And assuming that Suzanne has that form on her enrollment cart, but right. yeah, without making it a required field, which again, I I don't like required fields on something like this because you don't want to make roadblocks for people, and if they're not real sure they could get frustrated and leave and you'd lose the registration. So, I mean, that's, uh, right. you know, that's always kind of hard. So good question though, yeah, Suzanne, and that is a, right. you know, constant struggle. Um, mm -hmm. We don't questions. require it there either. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, very good. Well, um, Maxie, Sharon, I'm going to let you, I guess, uh, I guess so. Close if there's any comments or get us ready for the next go round. So excellent job, Maxie. Maxie, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. You, you've got a strong team there. You can all hear how closely they work together as a team, how they uh, set goals together, how they plan ahead for that coding carefully before things start. So you're planning for the end result before you even get started. And, and I applaud you for that. It's fun to work with your team. I do want to share with everybody that in just a few minutes, I've got to take over the screen again, maybe, all these buttons, that we were going to end the day today with Miss Lindsay, who will be sharing about AceWeb email templates. And um, this was a highly requested uh, topic again. About 70% of those that responded wanted to know about more about AceWeb email templates. And you are in for a pleasant way to end your day with Lindsay. So we would like to see you back here at 3 o'clock Central Time for this session. And until then, you can take a quick break. And we will see you shortly. Thanks again, Maxie, for joining us. We appreciate it so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. I appreciate you. Bye. Bye-bye.